distinguished dictionaries and encyclopedias. I think that all these associations that are connected with the word are really very much on a par. There's no line to be drawn between some that are analytic and some that are synthetic. <laughs> and actually Husserl is one of my heroes, and of course Pat and I also taught several seminars on him. He uh, is very similar to Pat on that point, and his notion of a noema, which uh, compared to Frege's notion of zin, is different in one important way from zin, because zin for Frege is much more like the dictionary definition, but the noema for Husserl is very, very rich. It comprises lots of different factors. There's no end really to the fact that it's inexhaustible. There are lots of factors that we're not even aware of. And uh, these factors are then sediments from past experience. They depend on our interests, the situation we are in. Some features that turn out to be prominent in some situations and not in others, and many other factors. And I mentioned one example now, and that's what we call one wholeness. If you look at these three items, then uh, we ask what are the features that we are paying attention to. And the features that we pay attention to are often reflected in our pointing out certain kinds of similarities. And most people would say these are similar because they're suitable for drinking vessels. And this one is different. That's a donut and it's suitable for eating, maybe. <laughs> but uh, this kind of uh, property that we then assign to cups and glasses that they're drinking vessels. That's just one property, of course, and lots of others, and what properties we focus on depends a good deal on what we're interested in. So if you now look at this and see how that changes, <laughs> then you'll see that, well, these are really something in common, but what is it that in common? They have one wholeness. So therefore, a topologist, for example, would pay a lot of attention to that feature. So that shows how these features we pay attention to, and we could say go into the meaning of that notion, are really very, very much dependent both on background, sedimentation, and uh, application, and what is happening. And this is also exactly what Pat is interested in. This example is similar to one you find in Husserl, who was very interested in topology as a source of a lot of these notions that we are interested in. And now, Pat introduces, and I have to be quick because he introduces one important notion in his approach to meaning, and that's the notion of congruence. He says that sameness of meaning is like congruence in geometry. So that uh, he really introduces this notion, which has a lot of features over from Felix Klein, an important person in the development of German mathematics, who founded the Erlanger program in 1872, when he was only 23 years old. <laughs> and uh, that's the notion of invariance and the transformations. We saw how one-holdedness was invariant and the transformations with that donut and cup. And uh, there's a similar idea is like the incarnate intention of isomorphism. That is, that there is a congruence in structure between notions. And Pat says that two utterances are belief congruent for a person if and only if one can substitute one for the other in all belief statements of the person's sub veritate. That raises some problems of circularity because in order to get it to work, you really have to include in those statements lots of uh, tricky non-intentional, non-extensional notions. And uh, Pat uh, does also go into that a little bit. But you have to be very careful. And uh, since we have so little time, I just mentioned one further feature of Pat's approach. And that is that he thinks also that uh, we have to be charitable. We have to assume that people have coherent beliefs. And uh, that means one's belief should be consistent with one another. At least they should not be obviously inconsistent. No person knows all the logical consequences of what they believe in. <laughs> and here, since Jaco is here, I would like to mention his very early work in connection with the work Knowledge and Belief in 1964, where he discusses the notion of surface topology. That is, when we are charitable, we should permit inconsistencies when they are so far away that it really requires a lot of logical insight to see that here we have an inconsistency. 
And we have a doctoral student, Wes Holliday, I don't know whether he's here now, that he's written this dissertation on fallibilism and the limits of closure. And this notion of closure, of course, is a little connected with this, that we are not really willing to accept all logical consequences of what we believe as conditions for being able to believe. But we should uh, uh, have certain kinds of limitations, and it's very tricky, as Jacob first pointed out, to see how uh, we are going to draw the line between those consequences that it's really natural to take into account, and those that it's not so natural to take into account. Well, this was extremely quick, and it does not do justice to Pat's very rich work in this field, but I think that's what we have to end with, because now, Nancy is going to start. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.